Yeah, we are in the book of Acts, y'all. If you got a Bible, go to Acts 13, Acts 13. Come on! And if you're new to Victory, we have been in this series for about 12 weeks now, and I love it. We're going line upon line, verse upon verse, chapter by chapter through the book of Acts. And this whole book is about how God birthed the church, how he started the church right after Jesus rose from the grave. He told his disciples at the beginning of Acts, Wait here in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit will come. In Acts chapter 2, Pentecost happened, which was basically the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God showed up. These guys started speaking in other tongues. They started praying for the sick. People got healed. Then they started preaching this message about Jesus. People got saved, and the whole city was turned upside down. And then they faced adversity, opposition, difficulties, challenges. And with every bad thing they faced, the church grew more resilient. The church continued to multiply. No leader, no emperor, no governor, no mayor, no uh, persecution could stop the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against this church. By the way, it is still the same today. The church continues to grow, advance, bring hope, healing, love, life, and nothing can stop it. Come on. That's the church that you're a part of. You just walked into victory today. You didn't walk into defeated church. You didn't walk into victim church. You walked into victory church. And the name of the place is important. The name of the place, the name that you attach to a place, the name that you attach to your life, to your season is important. And I want to title this message, Name Change. Acts 13, verse 1. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Let me stop right there. This is a church that doesn't just have one type of ministry. We have the five-fold ministry here at Victory, and that's what Antioch had. They had prophets, teachers, pastors, apostles. They had people who were called to do ministry in different ways. We need all the gifts of the ministry flowing in the house. I'm so thankful for people who teach Sunday school here, who are teaching in the Bible college here. I'm thankful for the prophetic gifts that flow here. There's a place for all of us in this church to be used by God. And then he lists the names. He says Barnabas. By the way, that name means the son of encouragement. He was just an encourager. Then there was Simeon, there was Lucius, there was Manane, who was a childhood friend of Herod, and then there was Saul. And by the way, all of these people who were uh, part of this early church, they all had different backgrounds. Some of them came from wealthy homes, some of them came from poor homes, some of them uh, came from different countries, some of them came with a different background, different past. And I love how the church wasn't just one type of person. When you come to Victory, you see all different nations, all different ethnicities, people from all different backgrounds. On one row, you got a millionaire with a homeless man, with a guy who just got out of prison, who's getting saved, who's getting his life back on track. You got families who are, I'm so thankful that Victory is a house where all people can come, no matter what season you're in, if you're married, divorced, single, you are welcome in this house. And that's how the church at Antioch was. It was a church for everyone to come and experience what God was doing. While they were worshiping the Lord, y'all, when we worship the Lord, things happen. While they were worshiping, I just want you to underline that. While they were worshiping, God speaks when you're worshiping. And you don't have to have a band to worship. You don't have to have instruments to worship. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come, I'm coming back to the and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've been. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. We don't worship because the band is good. We don't worship because we're in a nice room with great lights and a nice sound system. We don't worship because they're singing our favorite songs. We don't worship because we like the personalities on stage. We don't worship because we know all the lyrics. We worship because God is good. He's on the throne. We don't worship just because we feel like worship. Here's the good thing about worship. You don't have to feel like worship to worship. It's not a feeling-based activity. It's a truth-based discipline. 
that I am going to worship whether I'm having the worst day or the best day. Because when I worship, God changes me. And when God changes me, I can step back into a circumstance that may not have changed, but I've got a better perspective. Because when I worship, God works in my heart and in my mind, and he reminds me that he's with me, that he's for me, that he's speaking to me. So while they were worshiping, while they were fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Is it okay if I teach a little bit today? Okay, good, because I'm, I'm going to. They said, set apart. The word set apart means put these two guys in a different place because what I'm about to do is going to be different for them. To be set apart is to be used in a specific way. We get excited to hear the word set apart. I want to be set apart. They were set apart for adversity. They were set apart for attacks because the anointing attracts attacks. Like if you want to be set apart, just know there's going to be a big target that's drawn on your back and the enemy is coming for you. Set apart does not mean you're going to be set apart from difficulty or trials. You're going to be set apart to endure it. And God wouldn't have set you apart if he didn't grace you to handle what he set you apart for. When I was younger, I remember my dad saying, Paul, you are set apart. And I say, what does that mean? He'd say, God is setting you apart. There's an assignment God has on your life. By the way, you are set apart. You don't have to be a special person to be set apart. You just have to make the decision, I surrender. Lord, I'm giving you my heart. If you can use anybody, you can use me. Lord, you can use the imperfect, ordinary, broken me. But God, if you can use anyone. This is what Paul and Barnabas did, is they set themselves apart to be used by God. And then the Holy Spirit said, I've got a specific work for them to do. And then in verse three, it says, after they fasted and prayed. By the way, there's importance on fasting and prayer. Fasting stirs up a hunger. It's to give something up. There's been seasons in my life where God said, I want you to give up social media. I want you to give up food uh, for a few days. I want you to give up pop for the next month. I want you to give up the use of the, the, the iPhone, the smartphone. I want you to give this up. And what does it do? It causes us to get a sharpened, heightened awareness of what the Holy Spirit is trying to say to us. And so as they were fasting and they were praying and they were listening to God, God began to speak to them. And then it says the elders placed their hands on them and sent them off. And this is important. We skip over this because we think it's not a big deal. But I got my grand grand on the front row and grand grand, you have many times put your hand on my shoulder. Would you stand up? This is grand grand. She works here at Victory. She's 98 years young, still working full time. And you oftentimes have put your hand on me and Ashley and you have prayed over us. And this is what the elders would do in the New Testament as, as Paul and Barnabas were going out, they would ask for the elders to lay hands on them and just say, would you pray for me? Lord, I just pray a covering over the next generation. There is there's a transference. There's a transference of anointing that flows when the elders lay hands on you on your head, on your shoulder, and they begin to pray, there's a covering that happens. I have people who do this for me. My mom does this, Grand Grand, John Bevere, Larry Stockstill, people in our church like Ron McIntosh, Terry Henshaw, they will lay hands, and sometimes we think, oh, I don't wanna do that, but we're, we're one of those churches that still believes in altar calls. We're an old school, like, we love Jesus, we love what the Holy Spirit's doing. We're not, we're not embarrassed by it. I think some churches have walked away from things that they don't understand, and yet there is power in the laying on of hands from elders to say, we bless Daniel, we bless Dom, we just pray a blessing over Antonio and Holland, and I want the blessing of the elders, I want their prayers. My dad used to, thank you so much, Gregory. my dad used to bring me and John to the back room when he was pastoring, and anytime there was a guest speaker that was coming through, he'd say, I want you to lay hands on my boys and cast the demons out of Paul and, uh, and John. <laughs> he didn't say there was demons, but he was like, you know, we were like Ren and Stimpy. We were like, ha, 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 ha. And he was like, I just need Paul to be peaceful and John to be joyful. And he would say, just pray over them. But I remember as these pastors and leaders would come and they put their hand and I felt, even when my father was passing away in the hospital, I, I knelt by his bedside and I put his hand on my head. And I said, God, I want everything that you were doing in him to flow through his hand right now into me. And I just sat there and I just kept his hand on my head because there's, a, there's power, let's not neglect. I was reading this book by my friend Daniel Grothy and 
he had a whole chapter on the importance on the laying on of hands from elders, that we need the covering of those older saints that are speaking over us, that are praying over us, that are speaking into us truth and grace and love and that protection and that covering. Don't miss that. Don't miss that here at this church. We've got opportunities for you to receive that. Every service at the altar call, there's elders that are ready to pray for you. So once they were prayed for, they were sent out. And they went out, the two of them, led by the Holy Spirit. And they went to go and proclaim the word of God. And in verse five, it says, John came alongside to help them. It's important to know that there's people who will come in your life that may not stay in your life. They come for a season. In this moment, John is literally only with them for about six verses, and then he's gone. Like if you look at verse 13, it says, and then John left them. And Barnabas stayed. And when people come and go, you've got to learn how to recognize that some people are like scaffolding. They'll help get the building up, and once the building's up, the scaffolding is removed. They're there for a season. They're there to help you. Don't take it personal. John came alongside to help them. They traveled to Paphos, and there they met a Jewish sorcerer. All right? This was a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. That's a cool name. But he had a deceptive spirit. And the pro-counsel, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and, and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means. And it's important to know what does your name mean? What's the meaning? What's in a name? When Ashley and I got ready to name each of our kids, we prayed and we would ask, you know, people, you know, what did you name your kids? And what does that name mean? And we were looking up online. And so we got to Liam Josiah, and then we had Beniah David, and then we prayed over Mac Elliot, and then we prayed over Eliana Hope. I'm trying to remember all the names. <laughs> then we got, we got to the last one, Gianna Grace. And with each name, we wanted to know what was the meaning. We wanted to understand it. When my parents named me Paul, they named me Paul after the Apostle Paul. And, and, and Saul, he understood at this moment the meaning of a name. He understood what this name carried. And this man, um, Elimas, he, he carried a spirit of deception. And it says he opposed them and he tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. So he was trying to twist their words and change this man who was a wealthy, intelligent man who was about to uh, become a Christian. He was trying to convince him not to become a Christian. Then Saul, verse nine, who was also called Paul. And by the way, this is the only verse in the entire Bible where Saul's name changes. Not because God changed his name. It's, it's not like, you know, in the Old Testament, there was a moment where Jacob, his name was changed to Israel, and God changed his name. Saul decides, I no longer wanna go by Saul of Tar Tarsus anymore. I now wanna be called Paul the Apostle. And from this moment on, he transitions his name into a new name. In our world right now, a lot of people are deciding to change things about themselves. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of confusion out there. Did you know you have the power to name your season and to name who God has called you? You don't have to accept the labels of the world, the lies of what other people, what the enemy whispers in. You don't have to label yourself depressed. You don't have to carry the name addicted. You don't have to carry the name condemned, ashamed, regretful, guilty, I hate myself. You don't have to carry those labels and lies and limits. You can begin to look in the mirror and say, I'm forgiven, I'm redeemed. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am not depressed. I have the joy of the Lord. I'm more than a conqueror. You can begin to name, everybody say name change. From this moment on, Saul no longer goes by Saul. In fact, you never see the name Saul again concerning this man. There's other people named Saul that later on come around. But from this moment on, he goes by Paul. He changes his name, and when he changes his name, he starts walking in a greater authority. I've seen this happen with our second son, Beniah. He came home this last year during school, and uh, I've never seen him act like this, but he walked into the house, and he had like this strut. He's like, yo, what's up, daddy? I was like, Hey, Benny, you know, <laughs> and he goes, don't call me Benaiah anymore. He's like, just call me Ben. Just call me Ben. And I was like, well, I, I'm your daddy, and I'm, I might still call you Benaiah or Benny. And he's like, okay, that's cool. He's like, but everybody else calls me Ben. And he had this new confidence. 
You ever, like when you were a kid, was there ever like a moment where you like accepted a new confidence with this nickname or this like, you just like, this is who I am. Like, don't call me that, call me this. That's what happened where Paul literally accepted a newfound confidence, a new authority. And he looks at this guy in verse 10 and he says, you're a child of the devil. Like that's super harsh, by the way. If you were out in the lobby and you heard me say to someone, you're a child of the devil, you're like, wow, Paul's gotten really intense lately. Um, And we might be quick to judge Paul on this right here, but Paul wasn't necessarily angry at the person, he was angry at the spirit that was flowing through the person because the spirit was trying to talk out this man from getting saved. And Paul wasn't saying, you're going to hell, he was saying, your deception is so off and so wrong that God won't let it happen any longer. And watch what Paul says next. He says, you are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Then he says, now the hand of the Lord is against you and you're about to be blind for a time. If there was anyone who understood what it was like to go through a blind season, it was Paul. If there was anyone who understood what it was like to go dark and not be able to see anything and be trying to feel your way through the next season, It was Paul. Paul wasn't saying, listen, you're gonna miss out on God's plan for your life. He was saying, God's about to wake you up, and in order to wake you up, he's gonna hit you with blindness for a second. And once you get your your sight back, you're gonna understand who you really are, and the deception is gonna be gone. All right, so the first spirit, I wanna give you a few spirits we've gotta confront that try to come against who God has named us to be, and that's the first spirit of deception. We're in a time right now where the world is rampant with deception deceiving and twisting and perverting the word of God to fit what we feel in the moment. Deception is taking something that might sound truthful and then twisting it into a lie. And if the enemy can convince you of a lie, if he can convince you to believe a lie, he'll get you to start behaving according to that belief in that lie. So if I believe Inflation is high, gas prices are high, Um, God's not going to provide for me like he used to provide for me, the economy is dictating what God can do. If I start believing this, then I start operating financially based off that belief, that fear-filled belief. Instead of basing my belief on the word of God, and by the way, belief is so big, because we behave the way we believe. We live, I live my life, my actions are not just like thoughtless actions, my actions all start as a thought and the thought comes from a belief, a belief about God or a belief about me. So if the enemy can deceive us to say, you're not really, a, uh, you're not really God doesn't know what he did when he created you, he made a mistake, you, you should change yourself. And he can get a generation confused about their gender, their sexuality, or he can get church people confused about the scriptures around tithing and finances and whether God's faithful to provide, and if his word is really true for today, and whether or not we can trust God during a tight season, if he can convince you of a lie and deceive you, and deception is rampant, or if he can convince you of cheap grace, you can do whatever you want, the grace covers it. God loves you no matter, God loves you no matter what. But listen, I love my kids no matter what, but when they miss it, I'm gonna sit down and talk to them about it. When they disrespect their mom, when they do something they shouldn't do, I'm not kicking them out of the family. I'm not, I'm not saying like, hey, you're not a darty anymore. Get out of the house. You're still in the family. I still love you, but I'm gonna discipline you. But where there is a deceived teaching out there is that you can do whatever you want and God's cool with it. That's not true in the scripture. And where this man was operating was from a place of deception. And Paul confronted the spirit of deception and he took authority. Somebody say, take authority. When you know who you are, when you change from a place of being confused, insecure, unworthy, unqualified, or just deceived, once you know who you are, you can begin to operate in greater authority. By the way, Saul's name didn't change until six years after his conversion. A lot of people think, you know, Saul was on the road to Damascus, scales came off and he changed to Paul. No, scales came off, he went to preach in Damascus, then he went to Jerusalem, then he went to Arabia, then he went back to Jerusalem. For six years, Saul was still being known as Saul of Tarsus as a minister. But here was the place where he goes, you know what? I'm leaving that name behind. And I'm now gonna walk in a greater, you can decide today to say I am leaving behind what I was known for in high school, in college, in last year, in last month. You get to decide 
that you are saying, no longer am I gonna walk in that old name. I am a child of God. I know whose I am. I know who I am. It's time for a name change for some of y'all. You've been saved for six years, but you've still been carrying Saul's name around, and it's time to transition into an understanding, a revelation that I am forgiven, I'm redeemed, I'm not addicted, who the sun sets free is free indeed, I'm not depressed, I am not suicidal, I'm not insecure, I'm not unworthy, I'm not walking around confused, I have clarity, I have a sound mind in Jesus' name. Once he changed his name, he never went back. And from this moment on, it says the pro council gave his heart to Jesus because he was amazed at the power in the teaching that flowed. Now, verse 13. There, Paul and his companions sailed to Pamphylia, and that's when John left them. And I underline that, John left them. Here's a bonus spirit that I didn't put in my notes. A spirit we've all got to confront is a spirit of abandonment. John left them. Paul never forgot this. Two and a half years later, Barnabas convinces Paul, or he tries to convince him. He says, hey, John wants to come back to ministry with us. He's ready to come back and serve the Lord with us. Paul goes, no way. I bet Paul had some other words to say that weren't included in the book of Acts. It's like, no, I'm not letting him back in. He left me when I needed him the most. Paul's abandonment with people it really affected him. There's other moments where people left him for other things and, and Paul just carried almost, and we've gotta be careful that we guard our hearts against this feeling that I'm abandoned by people. Where does abandonment come from? It comes from being attached to people. We get attached to relationships. We get attached to people. So when they're gone, we're like, you cut me off, I'm cutting you off, you know? And Barnabas finally, later down the road, like 15 years later, Paul's heart heals towards John Mark and there's a reconciliation but you don't have to carry a spirit of abandonment. You are not an orphan. You are adopted in the family of God. You are not forsaken. We don't have to walk around feeling like everybody's left us. God is with you, and that's what matters most. Then Paul stood up and he began to preach. And as he began to preach, he went from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I love this. He says, listen, y'all, God delivered us out of Egypt. God brought us into the promised land. So he's speaking to his fellow Jews. And he says, listen, God had a plan from the beginning for salvation for all. And then Israel asked for a king and God gave them what they asked for. He gave them King Saul. Be careful when you get what you asked for from God because it's not always what you want. After removing Saul in verse 22, God gave them David. And I love what he says. This is in Acts. This is a thousand years after David has died. They say, God gave them David, a man after God's own heart. Now, how many of y'all know David was not perfect, right? And yet he's remembered as a man after God's own heart. You don't have to live a flawless life to be remembered as a woman who pursued God. You don't have to live a perfect life. I, if I was to ask how many of y'all in the room have ever made a mistake, every hand would go up. The goal is not to arrive at the end of our life flawlessly never making a mistake. The goal is that when you miss it, when you make a mistake, that you run back into the house of the Lord, that you fall on your knees, that you say, God, I need you. In this time of grace, I'm coming to you. I'm asking for your mercy. David wasn't perfect, but he was a man who sought God's heart, and that's what God's looking for. Not perfect people, but surrendered people. From this man, God gave Jesus. And then Paul begins to preach. He says, listen, you crucified Jesus. You tried to kill him. But I love this, and verse 30 says, but God. Somebody say, but God. How many of y'all know that you wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for but God moments, but God saved you, but God got in your life, but God delivered you out of that situation? You would be dead today if it wasn't for a but God moment. And I love that he says, but God raised him from the dead, and we've got good news for you. Verse 38, he says, through the, the Savior, through Jesus Christ, there is forgiveness for all of our sins. Church, who saved you? How did he save you? By, through, in, not in yourself, not in a church, not in a set of rules, not in the Mosaic law, but in Jesus Christ. Who saved you? Did you save you? Did your good deeds save you? Did you follow in all of Moses' laws save you? 
No, Paul goes on to say this in verse 39. He says, through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification, which means being made right with God, that you weren't able to do by following the law of Moses. In other words, you were saved by the grace of God. None of us can be saved by following the law of Moses. We'll never be able to measure up. This is why we needed a savior. This is why we needed Jesus. And what saved you is what's gonna keep you saved. I'm gonna say that again. Who saved you is what's gonna keep you saved. It was the grace of God that saved you and it's the grace of God that's gonna keep you saved. Don't forget what got you in because what got you in is what's gonna keep you in the house. I don't stay in the house because I earned it this week. I stay in the house because the grace of God that saved me when I was six is still saving me when I'm 36. It's still gonna save me when I'm 56. Don't forget what got you in. Because sometimes we get twisted and we get deceived and we go, I'm leaving because I messed up or we're kicking them out because they missed it. No, no, no. It was the grace of God that brought us to salvation and it's the grace of God that keeps us in justification, right standing with God. And he says, take care, take heed that you don't miss what the religious people missed. He says, look, you scoffers, wonder and perish for I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe even if someone told you. What was he talking about? He was talking about the entire human race is invited, not just Jews, but Gentiles. That's anyone who was not born as a physical Jewish ancestor. That's me and probably a lot of you in this room today. He says, this entire human race is invited to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. There was never an opportunity like that before, but they missed it. The religious leaders missed it because they thought the only way in was through their good deeds. What's gonna change who you are, change your name, is the, the revelation of the grace of God. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. That would be like you guys after today going, Paul, that was pretty good. It's like a base hit, double base hit. We want you to come back next week, get us to third base. Maybe we'll have a home run next week. Thank you, there's still a chance. They invited Pastor Paul back to preach again. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. I wanna just say that one more time. Continue, repeat this with me. Continue in the grace of God. Say it again. Continue in the grace of God. This is how we know whose we are. This is how we know who we are. Some of us have been carrying around a name of condemnation, shame, guilt, because last week we knew who we were, but somewhere in the middle, we missed it. We made a mistake on Wednesday or Thursday and we forgot. And this is why Paul says, you need to continue. Once you go from Saul to Paul, once you go from before Christ to a transition into knowing Christ and knowing who you are in Christ, what's gonna keep you going forward is not what you did this week or what you did last week or how good you were today, but continue in what the grace of God, continue in his grace. It was his grace that saved you, and it's his grace that continues your salvation and fear and trembling. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. The second spirit that we need to confront that comes after God's name for our lives is the spirit of jealousy. Jealousy is saying, I want what you have. I'm not happy with what I have and I need what you have. It's envy, it's comparison, it's these Jewish leaders couldn't stand that Paul and Barnabas had momentum that they didn't have. And jealousy gets your eyes off of your lane, off of your business, off your ministry, off of what you're called to do, and you start looking at everyone else. My friend Robert Madu posted something um, a couple weeks ago, it was really funny. He said, I've got two free vacation spots that anyone can go to right now, and it's hardly occupied at all. You don't have to pay for gas to get there. You don't have to pay for a flight to get there. These two free vacation spots are ready and open for you. There's plenty of space. And I you know, turned this slide, and the first slide was vacation spot number one, your own business. Vacation spot number two, your own lane. Because people are just not minding their own business or staying in their own lane. Like we're all up in each other's business. We're all trying to figure out what's going on over here and why are they doing this and what happened there. Y'all, 
There is a free, wide open lane. The spirit of jealousy moves me out of my lane and I start looking at everybody else's lane. I'm, I'm, I'm no longer focused on what God's called me to do. And we all, we all got enough to do on our own that we don't need to be looking at everybody else. These Jewish leaders missed what God had for them because they were jealous and their jealousy led them to heaping abuse. So they begin to speak abusive words over them. Now, Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. How do I confront that spirit of jealousy? Paul and Barnabas, they didn't let it stick. Instead, they just kept preaching the word of God. Somebody said, keep on preaching, keep on preaching. And when the people heard the word of the Lord, it says everyone who was there put their faith in Jesus Christ. They, they believed in God and the word of the Lord spread through the whole region. Verse 50, but the Jewish leaders incited, I love this, they incited, I don't love it, but it's just so interesting. They incited the God-fearing women of, the, the, of high standing and they incited the leading men of the city. They stirred up a persecution against Paul and Barnabas. When Paul and Barnabas were anointed, they were anointed to face adversity. They were set apart to handle challenge after challenge, opposition after opposition. And it got so bad that these people in the city expelled them from their region. And here's the next spirit we gotta confront, and that's the spirit of rejection. Because there will be people in your life who just can't stand you, and they will reject you. And you will walk through seasons where you go, what did I do to deserve this type of rejection? And Paul and Barnabas must have been in a place where they were strong enough to handle the rejection because the next verse says, so they shook the dust off their feet. I remember talking to my dad, this was when I was like 18, and he walked through a very um, intense rejection that happened in his life from, from, from people that were close. And I could tell it had affected him. I was a teenager and I could just tell he was going through it. And I was like, dad, how are you handling this? And he's like, I'm just praising God. The Lord is still with me. The Lord is still with us. When you walk, how many of y'all have ever walked through rejection before? It can be painful. It can be hurtful. And you're trying to figure out what did I, why is this so intense? Why is the rejection? And what you've got to do is in order to not let it stick and turn into resentment and bitterness where you take that hurt on someone else, you've got to learn to shake the dust off. You've gotta learn how to worship. You've gotta to learn to remind yourself, they did not qualify me. They did not anoint me for this. They're not the ones who called me into ministry. So I'm not going to let their rejection or their acceptance define who I am. I am still a chosen instrument of God. I am still called to do what God's called me to do. You gotta remember where your calling comes from. Because if you live off the acceptance of man, you will die from the rejection of man. If every week I'm trying to figure out who I am based on your approval ratings of whether or not it was a good enough sermon, then I'm gonna be on a roller coaster of knowing what my name means, whether my name or my calling is, is qualified or if I'm ready to do this. But I've gotta know, listen, it's not the acceptance or the rejection of people that determines who I am in Christ. It is God who has named me. He has called me by name. He has set me apart. He has called me a holy nation, a royal priesthood. He's called me more than a conqueror. And this is where we find our, our, our identity. So they shook off the dust. Somebody say, shake it off. And once they shook it off, the disciples were filled with joy. I love that. They were filled with joy. Some of us have been carrying a heaviness. We've lost our laughter. Y'all, laughter is medicine for our soul. I've been laughing more lately, like just intentionally, like just giggling, laughing. This last week, I had so much laughter just flowing out of me that I, I almost thought I was, I was a little embarrassed by it. And people around me were like, this guy's just laughing too much. Proverbs 31 says, the woman who fears the Lord laughs at the days to come. In other words, there is a trust. Laughter, it, it, when, when, when we're not laughing, when we're filled with depression, anxiety, stress, some of us have named ourselves stressed. So people ask, how are you doing? I'm stressed. What's your name? I'm stressed. You doing okay? I'm depressed. I'm stressed. I'm overwhelmed. Oh, life is so hard, gas prices, it's crazy, inflation, sandwiches cost like $10, coffee's like nine bucks now, and I'm just stressed. Stop. Life is way too short to let stress and depression kill you. And we got people going into ministry 
that look like they're 18 and one year later they're 88 years old. Like people are aging four times faster than they should be. And it's not just ministry, it's working anywhere. It's working at Quick Trip or Starbucks. People are just aging really fast and we're losing our life because we're letting things stress us out. The disciples, even in the midst of opposition and rejection, found joy. I don't have to let the rejection of people age me faster than I should. I can find joy. I can find peace. Can I go on a little bit further? I'm almost done. I want the band to come out. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas, now we're in chapter 14, they went as usual into the Jewish synagogue and they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed in God and the Jews who refused to believe stirred up again another persecution and they poisoned the well. They poisoned the minds of brothers and sisters against Paul and Barnabas. I can't control what people think about me or what they say about me, but I can control what I think about me, what I say about me. And you might go, Paul, what good is it for me to name myself, you know, joyful? Why, why does that actually help? Because the more that you begin to speak something over yourself, you have naming rights over your life. Just like you have naming rights over your children, you get to name your kids Daniel or John or Jessica or Benny or Liam. You also get to name your season and say, I know I'm going through something tough this season, but I am naming this season purpose. And God is doing something good in my life today. And this is the day that the Lord, and I don't have to feel it to speak it. I can speak it even before I feel it. I don't have to feel like worshiping to lift my hands. I don't have to feel like preaching to preach the word of God over my life. And, and we, we live in such a feeling-based society that we don't let the word of God drive the narrative. It's time to get the names that God has spoken over you back in front of you. So here they, they have this moment where God begins to use them. And there was a plot where people wanted to kill them again. Every day, people wanted to kill Paul. My parents named me after him. I was like, cool. <laughs> also, my parents put a plaque in my room of what the name Paul meant, and it was small, little, humble. And I was like, what's up with that? I don't want to be a small guy. I had like a short man syndrome for a second growing up. Where I was like, I'm not small. I'm a big man. I'm strong. I'm mighty, you know? And, and they were like, just calm down, little Paul. And I was like, stop calling me little. I'm not a little guy, you know? But the reason Paul changed his name from Saul to Paul Paul means humble. Paul wanted to decrease so that Jesus would increase. Paul wanted to get lower because those who exalt themselves are humbled, but those who humble themselves, God lifts up. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace. Paul was like, I need more grace and I can't live like Saul of Tarsus anymore. At some point, I've gotta, I've gotta come back to this place where I need so much grace that I wanna humble myself under the mighty hand of God. So Paul would come in this place and he would just get lower and lower and God would continue to elevate him and would continue to minister to him and give him more grace. And Paul was like, I'm the chief of sinners. I need as much grace as I can get. We all need grace. How many of y'all need grace in the room today? And the more that Paul leaned on the grace of God, there was this one moment in Paul's life, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where he said, I was so tired and so afflicted by this thorn in my flesh and I didn't know how to get rid of it and I pleaded with God three times please remove this and then God said my grace is sufficient for you in other words I have graced you to handle this pain I've graced you to handle the difficulties the challenges you're going to leave today and you're going to face things this week that a sermon on Sunday will never be able to solve a church service is not gonna fix it. You're gonna go home, you're gonna face things that are difficult. You're gonna face things that are just hard. You're gonna face moments where you're just not sure if you can make it. But God says, I have graced you. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. And the more you humble yourself, for in your weakness, his strength is made perfect. So Paul said, I don't wanna go back to Saul anymore. There's nothing wrong with Saul but there's something about this name change that put him in a place to receive more grace. And he just said, Lord, I lean on you. In my weakness, your strength is made perfect. Your grace is sufficient. So Paul goes into this next city, lays hands on a man who's lame. This man is listening to him. He's been lame since he was birthed, since he was born. Some of y'all have been labeled things since you were born. People have said, well, this is who your daddy was, this is who your granddaddy was, this is who you are. 
And in that moment, Paul confronted that label on that man of permanent sickness. Some of you have had a permanent sickness, but today, the same God who healed 2,000 years ago, the same God who heals in Africa and Dominican Republic, he can heal in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Healings and miracles are still happening today. When Paul spoke to him, he says, stand up on your feet in Jesus' name. The man had faith to be healed, not faith in Paul, but faith in God. And immediately the man stand up and he began to jump and to begin to walk. Some of you have been called lame your whole life, but today you're having a name change. You're going to be the runner today. You're going to be the walker today. Today is your day to get back up on your feet. Some of you have been down in discouragement. You've been lame from depression. You've been lame from a divorce. You've been lame ever since your dad died. You haven't been able to get back up, but today in Jesus' name, you're getting back on your feet again. You're about to launch that ministry again. You're about to write that book again. You're about to do that next thing. The man got up. Watch what happens. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down among us in human form. (laughs) And the next spirit we got to confront is the spirit of celebrity because this has crept into the American church and it is disgusting in God's eyes. They go, oh, the gods, Pastor Paul, he's like Zeus. Pastor Barnabas, we worship you. Stop worshiping a preacher, a pastor, or a worship leader. They are humans. We are humans. We are weak. We are tired. We are tempted. No one is above another man. And when I've sat down with some of these guys who are very well known, I asked them, I said, do you like how much they've created this celebrity culture. They go, I hate it. And I don't know why it happened. And I don't know why they've blown me up to be so much bigger than I am, just a human. And church, we've got to confront the spirit of celebrity pastors, celebrity ministry. It's not them. There is a spirit. The enemy wants to distort the church to worship human personalities, whether it's worship leaders, preachers, pastors, whoever, bishops, apostles, and we start getting attached to a human personality and we elevate them and put them on pedestals and Paul tears his clothes off. Now, I'm not gonna illustrate that today. (laughs) But watch what happens. They start trying to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. In verse 14, it says, Paul tore his clothes and he rushed out into the crowd. He said, friends, friends, why are you worshiping preachers? Why do you show up for a personality when you should be showing up for the presence of God? We don't rush an altar call because Bishop T.D. Jakes is in the house, and I love Bishop. We don't show up because Pastor Mike Todd's in the house, and I love Mike. He's a friend. We don't show up because Stephen Furtick or because someone. We show up because Jesus is in the house. Jesus, the presence of God, is what sets the captives free. It is not a man, it's not a woman, it's not a stage, it's not a personality. We are all just humans in need of the grace of God. And we gotta take men and women off the idolatrous stage of a pedestal as if they are higher than all of us. No, we're not. And Paul says, stop, stop, stop. Because when you worship a man, you can turn and assassinate him the next second. This is exactly what happens. Paul says, guys, it's God who made the heavens and the earth, not us. It's God who heals people. It's God who preaches incredible words through us. It's not our words. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God who brings the rain. And by the way, we need rain in Oklahoma. I prayed this last night. Lord, bring more rain for the farmers and the crops and the trees and the plants. Y'all, we prayed last night and it got 90% chance of rain. It started raining today. God can bring the rain this week in Oklahoma and Kansas, Missouri, Texas. Y'all think I'm funny. I'm serious. We need rain. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. So Paul's preaching and he says, it's God who fills you with joy. It's not... It's not a sermon that fills you with joy. It's not, it's not a personality on a stage who fills you with joy. Even with these words in verse 18, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from the fickleness of the crowd, the spirit of the crowd. God, deliver us from the spirit of the crowd. Verse 19, some Jews came from Antioch and they won the crowd 
over. As fast as they can cheer you on, they can turn to crucify you in a second. And they stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. Let me stop right there. The next spirit we've got to confront is the spirit of cancel culture and the fickleness of the crowd. There is a spirit right now that says, if you don't like this person, cancel them. Stone them to death. Cancel. And the, the, the fickleness, we switch back and forth. We've got to come back to, we know who we are in Christ and we're going to treat people with that same nature that Christ treated people with love, with compassion, with kindness, with authenticity. We're going to surround people. We're not going to cancel people. We're going to pray for people. But Paul, what if I don't like them? Pray for them. But Paul, what if I think they're toxic? Pray for them. But Paul, what if I can't trust them? Pray for them. But Paul, what if they punched me in the face? Turn the other cheek and pray for them again. But Paul, I want to fight back. I want to cancel them. I want to stone them. I want to get rid of them. Pray for them. We got to confront the spirit of cancel culture. No matter who it is, no matter what political office or what thing they're doing or lifestyle, pray for them. And the last spirit we need to confront is the spirit of finality. The spirit of finality says it's over. They thought he was dead. Thinking he was dead. They dragged him outside the city. So he's laying there dead. And Paul looks like it's all over. And there is a spirit that comes over you that says it's all over. There's no more left. No more chapters left. I want some of my friends to come up here, some of those helpers. I want you to just surround me and stand behind me because this is what happens when you're in a moment where the enemy tries to kick you down. And some of you have walked through a divorce. Some of you have walked through something painful, a loss. Some of you are just in the middle of a situation where you just feel overwhelmed and surrounded. And you gotta be careful who surrounds you when you're down. Who do you let in your inner circle? Just go ahead and get all around me. And I want you to look at these names as Paul's laying down and just imagine who might be surrounding you when you're down. For some of us, we've accepted defeat. I'm just defeated. What's your name, defeated? What's your name, addicted? I'm never gonna get out of this. I'm stuck with this addiction. My daddy was this, my grandpa was this, that's all I'll ever be. I'm cursed. I'm cursed, man. I'm just cursed. Our family's cursed. And, and I'm confused. I'm confused and I'm sick. This sickness has been sitting there. I'm just sick. I'm sick and I'm, I'm stuck. I'm stuck and I'm ashamed. And I've got lack and I'll never have enough money and I'll never be enough. I'm discouraged. I'm paranoid. I'm worried. I'm prideful. I'm... And we allow these names. But you get to change the name today over what's being spoken over. You get to choose what names you're going to accept and what labels you're going to take away. Saul made a decision. No longer are you going to call me Saul anymore. I will now be called Paul the Apostle. Who said? I said. No, no, for real. In the scriptures, no one changed his name from Saul to Paul. He changed his name. He's like, from now on, you call me Paul. You call me Paul the Apostle, but we know you as Saul of Tarsus. We know you as defeated, as addicted, as cursed, as a terrorist, as a murderer, as an angry man, as a man with the temper. No, from this day forward, I'm peaceful, Paul. I want you to drop the labels. You're getting a new name today. You're going to be surrounded by some better names today. You now are surrounded by a sound mind. You're healed in your family. You're moving forward. You're hopeful. You're free. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. When these believers, in verse 20, when they surround surrounded him when they surrounded him and I believe there was Barnabas the encourager just saying I see a, a future for you Paul this is not your last chapter your best days are right in front of you you're going to be free you're going to walk in victory you're going to be instead of a warrior you're stepping into a new season of worship instead of being paranoid you're a prayer warrior you're now walking in victory you're not a victim anymore you got the victory it says when they circled around him I believe this is happening right now. The church is circling around some of you. Some of you have canceled people in your life and God's saying it's time to circle around them in prayer and speak a better name over them. It's time to speak a better name over your wife. Some of y'all came in with the wrong names. You were calling your husband this morning and God says, stop calling them that. It's a cuss word. You need to start calling them a mighty man of God in Jesus' name. Start calling your son healed and restored a sound mind over your young daughter. It's time to start speaking it over our nation. You can curse the nation or you can start speaking a blessing over the nation. In Jesus, I want you to stand your feet all over this place. It says, as they circled around, he got back up. Though a righteous man may fall seven times, he will get back up again. But I believe the way we get back up 
is by being surrounded by the right names that we are speaking over our season and over our future and over our hearts and over our minds and over our marriages and over our nation and over our church. We've got the naming rights. And today is time for a name change for some of you You came in today, afflicted, addicted, depressed, oppressed, possessed. Some of you came in today stressed, overwhelmed, afraid. Some of you are going back out this week and you go, Paul, I'm facing so many things. I just don't know if I can make it to next Sunday. But today, it's time to choose a new name, that you have a sound mind, that you have love in your heart, that you are gonna make it this week, that God is with you, that he's for you and he will not fail you. He will not fail you, that he's leading you. He's creating a highway in the desert. He's creating streams in the wilderness, that God is making a way where there seems to be no way, that he's leading you and guiding you as God was with Moses, so he will be with you, Joshua. He's going to protect you. He's going before you. He's your defender. He's your righteousness. When you look in the mirror, stop calling yourself ugly. Stop calling yourself dirty. Stop calling yourself damaged goods. From this day forward, you look in the mirror and say, I am a daughter of God. I am a son of God. I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed. I'm not rejected. I'm not abandoned. I am adopted in the family of God. I have a purpose. My best days are in front of me. God's not finished with me yet. I am not a victim. I walk in victory in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today, you just need a name change over your mind and your heart, and you need to start believing it and walking in it. I want you to lift your hand up all over your all over this room, but that's you if you're watching online. And here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Just leave your seat. Just come to this altar right now. Some of you, you need it. You need the hands laid on you today of the Holy Spirit to lift off that label, to lift off that lie, to remove that limiting belief today to begin to declare, I'm blessed in Jesus' name. I'm blessed to be a blessing. I am forgiven in Jesus' name. I want us to cheer on brave men and women that are coming down to this altar. Young boys and girls, moms and dads, grandparents, whatever season of life you're in, God looks at you and he says, you are a candidate for grace. There's a miracle in the house today. You've been lame since you were born, but today you're gonna walk again. Today you're gonna walk for the first time. Today you're gonna get your feet back. Today you're gonna get your life back, your joy, your laughter's coming back. Depression has to leave your house in Jesus' name. Secondly, you're here today and maybe you say, Paul, I'm not right with God. I need to get down to that altar. I need to get things right. I need to surrender to him. I need to repent. Come and join us. 